Greetings, everybody. You are watching Just For My People. I'm your host, Chris Carr. And today we have a special guest. Please introduce yourself, my friend. Thank you, Chris. My name is Matt Gallagher, and I am in Baltimore, Maryland, and I am fortunate to serve as the president and CEO of the Gold Checker Foundation. And for the folks out there that are not quite yet familiar, could you give them a brief breakdown of what the Gold Checker Foundation is? Sure. The Gold Checker Foundation is a private foundation. We are based in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, the foundation has been around for about 45 years. Um, we support grant making primarily in three areas, uh, community development, which is generally neighborhoods and housing work, uh, education, schools and scholarships, and then nonprofit capacity building, which is really investing in the professional management of 501c3 nonprofit organizations. So we help with strategic plans and board development, executive recruitment, really with an eye towards kind of professionalizing the management of these important uh, small nonprofit organizations that deliver so many services in Baltimore City. In a way, are you all then functioning kind of as an incubator or, or um, working to help cultivate or work with smaller organizations in their organizational structure or in kind of prepping them for how to grow uh, in that last capacity you were just discussing? Yeah, sometimes. Um, you know, we, what a typical year will grant to about 80 different organizations. And sometimes they might be a very large, mature organization. It's been around for a couple of decades. But more likely, it's a smaller grassroots organization, might have, you know, three to five people, very mission driven, uh, very close to the communities in which they live and work. And we are providing operating or programmatic support to uh, advance and accelerate the work that they might be doing. In some cases, that might be community development and community organizing, like really trying to pull different people together in a particular neighborhood and figure out, you know, which direction we want to go, what their priorities are. Sometimes it's advancing like more complex uh, development and neighborhood improvement projects. So we invest, you know, early stage, we invest in, you know, more mature organizations. Um, you know, we just, we're, we're always on the lookout for good grant making opportunities in Baltimore City. Good. Thanks. On the website uh, in the Our History section, it says, today the Gold Tucker Foundation works in partnership with the city's civic leadership, a well-established nonprofit sector, and a growing community of entrepreneurs to serve the Baltimore community. Through grant making, primarily in the areas of community development, education, nonprofit organizational development. Looking forward, the foundation is exploring opportunities to grow our portfolio of program-related investments. Members of the Gold Sacker family continue to serve on the board of directors, along with independent directors, and the input of an advisory committee comprised of the presidents of three of Baltimore's leading institutions. So with that being a part of the mission, what do you see your role is as president and CEO? What is it that you are there to do? Yeah. So... You know, we're fully endowed, which means that we're very fortunate we don't have to raise any money. Um, you know, the, what we do at the foundation, and we have a small staff of three people, um, myself and a program officer, we generally meet with probably close to 200 different nonprofits over the course of a year. Uh, we have discussions with them about their needs you know, for operating support and programmatic support. And then we evaluate those requests so that we can figure out the best way to disperse typically about four and a half million dollars of grant making each year. Um, we give away on average a little more than a million dollars every, uh, every three months or so. And, you know, it's um, in, in a city like Baltimore, there's very significant demand for these types of resources. So there's always more requests than we're in a position to fulfill. Um, and we spend a you know, significant amount of time really doing the due diligence, evaluating these requests, getting to know the people doing the work, 
so that we can try to make sure that we have a good strategic direction for the way these resources are applied. And then in between the meetings, we, you know, we are out in community, we're meeting with applicants, we're consulting with some of the organizations we're already granting to. In some cases, we're serving on boards. In some cases, we're leading boards. Um, you know, we want to make sure that our impact goes beyond just the direct dollars that we give away. So we really try to use our knowledge and expertise and connections to, to support our partners in as many different ways as we possibly can. What are some of the programs that have you excited? Like whether there are some from the past or some projects you're currently working on? Yeah, so, you know, I think that some of the things that really excite me right now are, um, I think that larger institutions, you know, the colleges and universities and the hospitals um, who are often like anchor employers in their community, they have historically been very kind of self-focused in terms of like what happens on their campus or what happens within their buildings. Um, and I think that there's been a bit of an awakening and an awareness in these institutions that, um, you know, they're not just like, a, you know, a castle on a hill with a moat around them, that the people who are coming for services or the people who are working in those buildings oftentimes live in the adjacent neighborhoods and communities. And that if they really want to maximize their impact, they have to think beyond kind of their traditional operations and their traditional roles. So in Baltimore, we've seen like an anchor institution strategy really emerge where these larger employers are much more focused on local hiring and local contracting. Um, they are much more focused on incentives uh, for their employees to, to live near where, like live near their, live, live near their work, right. meaning incentivizing their employees to, to buy and renovate houses in the surrounding community. And really, you know, for back of, lack of a better word, like figure out ways to kind of churn the impact so that rather than kind of hiring a caterer or a dry cleaner or a custodial company that might be, you know, one or two counties over or even outside of Baltimore City, looking to, to find those people who live here, who work here, who spend their money in the community and really trying to kind of integrate them into their purchasing practices. So I think that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, like everybody else, you know, for the last year and a half, everything's just been completely overrun with COVID and trying to kind of manage that. And as difficult as the times it's been for our city, um, we've really seen a lot of people and organizations rally um, in terms of, you know, getting the word out, making sure people are applying for the, the type of aid for which they're entitled to, um, seeing some of our service organizations that maybe used to deliver services in one way have to, to switch gears a little bit and, and deliver services in new and creative ways. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, like I'm happy that we seem to be kind of coming out of things a little bit, but, um, you know, it's been great to see these different organizations rally, figure out how they can still be impactful. In some cases, like change up and like really focus in on making sure people are getting fed, um, you know, figuring out like ways to maximize access to, you know, vaccines. Um, you know, it's been one of those all hands on deck moments and it's been, it's been it's been great to see how some of our grantees have responded. Right. Something that came up in New York, um, people developing mutual aid groups. And it was this kind of space where they weren't organized, not for profits, but they weren't just a bunch of friends who randomly were taking action. Uh, and some of those groups grew into not for profits. Some of those groups and, and individuals created community groups that are now blossoming and are putting in work in areas where there was need, but maybe people didn't realize they could fill that need or they didn't think that they had the experience to do and they were kind of pushed in, into that position. In terms of the, the next year or two, are there any projects that, that you see or you've recently seen that you're excited uh, to watch go into implementation phase or-, or Yeah, or absolutely. Um, you know, some foundations will only give money to organizations that have established their 501c3, who have like a fully built out board, 
who have three years of financial results and audits. Um, you know, we really pride ourselves on being a little bit closer to the ground. And if we find people who um, we think are leaders in their community, if we find people who we think have really good ideas, we will oftentimes kind of seed those early stage efforts. You know, we'll pay for things like community organizing. Uh, we will pay for, you know, early staffing support so that maybe somebody is kind of starting a new project and they're doing it really on an all volunteer basis. Like we'll give them a grant so that they can spend 25, 50% of their time really kind of digging into the work and making sure that they're getting compensated for that. Um, you know, one of the things that we saw kind of come out of COVID were a lot of people figuring out ways to be more self-reliant, you know, and we got a lot of requests for five and $10,000 you know, maybe it's a community development organization that had never done, you know, feeding before. Um, and they've opened up, you know, a pantry or, or some type of, uh, you know, grab and go service for people who are in that community. Um, you know, we are seeing organizations kind of come to us and make non-traditional ass right now because they have started to kind of change up the way that they do things. And, um, you know, that's something that we're going to we're going to try to be responsive to going forward because we want to meet people where they are and, um, you know, small grants to kind of initiate new ideas and new programs makes a lot of sense. You bring up, I think, a conversation that may be difficult for some people. Hopefully it's not in this scenario of how to balance the reality of money and organizational structure and the fact that some of the people or groups that are very active in certain communities do not have that skill set, and and that you'll find people that are great community workers, they have amazing minds, but they have an inability to sign paperwork or organize in a way that tends to put them in proximity to more institutional funding or government backing. Yep. Um, how do you navigate that and negotiate that? Yeah, it can be challenging. Um, you know, I think first off, you really want to be as close to the work as possible so that you have a chance to observe these high impact community members who are, you know, in their neighborhoods, who are in community, and you can see that they're credible, that they're legitimate, that they're doing the work. And you don't want to penalize anybody for being grassroots. You want to figure out a way to provide, you know, within reason support so that they can be even more successful at what they do. Um, <clears throat> it's daunting that if you run a youth program or, you know, you run a neighborhood watch program, or if you are, you know, a small developer who rehabilitates, you know, vacant and abandoned houses, it can be intimidating to say, oh, wait a minute, I have to register my organization, I have to form a board, I have to file all the paperwork with the IRS for a 501c3, I have to go hire an auditor. These are big steps, and they're potentially expensive steps. Um, so we find that there's a good, like, interim step. So that if we find like a really promising person in the community, um, we can partner, you know, with them through a fiscal sponsor, which is basically somebody who agrees to be the back office support to handle all that paperwork, to handle the accounting of the money. So that, you know, we have some, you know, assurances that the money's being spent in ways consistent with what the intended purpose is. That's one strategy. The other strategy is I think that more and more funders are starting to realize just how daunting it is to kind of start a new nonprofit or a social enterprise. And we've been trying to develop, you know, some really good talent pipelines so that when you find some of these individuals, you get them a fellowship. They are part of a cohort. You know, maybe the people aren't doing exactly the same thing. <clears throat> but they're all on the same stage of development in terms of the work that they're doing. And there's kind of, there's strength and safety in numbers. And if you can get people who are working to build something new, 
you can get them together in kind of a structured cohort where they can exchange ideas, where they can hear about funding opportunities, where they can learn from each other's mistakes. We think there's a lot of value in that as well. So we support an organization called Baltimore Corps. And Baltimore Corps offers all kinds of different help in you know, early stage funding and financing, uh, fellowship opportunities, placements. Um, we want to we want to kind of create these organizations and spaces to meet people where they are, and really hold up the the talent that's out there that maybe sometimes goes overlooked. That's awesome. Uh, it for me, it's something that comes up when I do diversity work with tech companies. Um, this idea of the expectation of a group, a person that may be in a marginalized community of like having the same exact resume or having the same kind of ostensible qualifiers, maybe we change what we're looking for, or maybe we extend an understanding of, okay, in this arena, having this, this, and this might make sense. But in this case, maybe we look for something slightly different and then we can help facilitate this, this, and this. And you start getting a diversity of thought. You start getting people in the room problem solving together that often can align in ways um, that is, is very unique. Um, in terms of with your, your organization being in Baltimore, historically, there has been a large black population in Baltimore. And in more recent times, uh, there seems to have been a lot of difficulty with managing some of the crime, some of the poverty, some of the empty houses. How do you think folks can get involved and, and people who want to participate in social good, social change, want to either start a not-for-profit or work with a not-for-profit um, or support one of the entities you work with? What can a person do? Like, like when they feel overwhelmed and they're like, they want to do something and don't know what to do. What, what are some ideas that you would have? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. Um, you know, Baltimore, you know, has some challenges that you alluded to in terms of crime and abandonment and, you know, managing a very significant number of abandoned vehicles or, I'm sorry, abandoned properties and vacant properties. And you have to think about, you know, one, what are the issues that you care most about that you're most passionate about? And regardless of whether or not you live in a black or a white or a rich or a poor community, whatever it might be, there are some opportunities everywhere. So you can start off potentially with your church. You can start off potentially with your rec center. So you could be in a rich neighborhood, a poor neighborhood, a black neighborhood, a white neighborhood. Um, regardless of where you are, um, there are going to be opportunities to get plugged in and serve. You know, the first one that comes to mind is like, you know, faith-based institutions. Uh, the second would be rec centers. The third would be your neighborhood association. You know, almost every part of the city would have representation kind of in those three categories of organizations. Uh, beyond that, whether you're into, you know, more access to healthcare or the environment or public safety, there are organizations that have a citywide focus. Um, it really just depends on what a person's particular interest is and what's important to their community. You know, you think about the schools that are, you know, there's, there's a hundred and probably 50 plus public schools in Baltimore city. And all of them are gonna have parent teacher organizations. All of them are gonna have volunteer opportunities associated with them. So it, it's, for the person who really wants to get engaged and get involved, there are a lot of one ramps, you know, for them to be impactful in their particular community. And, you know, in terms of starting something, you know, the first thing we always do is encourage people to take a look around and kind of look at the landscape and make sure that there's not somebody already doing that work, because if there is, you know, it's probably a better idea to kind of team up and work together than it is to potentially create a, a competing organization that's working in the same space. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is to meet people where they are. If they want to get engaged in their community, give them ample opportunities to do so. And I would say church, school, community group, neighborhood association, 
these are all great points to kind of plug into and, and figure out where you want to spend your time. All right. Well, thank you. Um, before we head out, is there anything you would like to um, let us know about or, or anything coming up in the next few weeks or months that you all are putting together that, that we should be aware of? Yeah, you know, it's um, I, I was not familiar with your organization before, but it seems like that you're doing really great work and that, you know, I love the idea of expanding land ownership. Um, you know, in a city like Baltimore, you know, We've been the same 80 square miles, you know, for probably close to 100 years. Um, and in terms of like homesteading, you know, there's, there's not kind of, uh, you know, the typical opportunities that are out there. But we have a whole wide range of programs that are available for people who want to, you know, renovate vacant and abandoned properties who are willing to put in sweat equity We've got financing programs to uh, improve owner-occupied homes um, at very, very low and no interest loans and grants. Um, I would encourage you to kind of spread the word that we're looking for community-oriented people who want to be in Baltimore. And in terms of affordability, this is a very unique place with amazing proximity to Washington and Philadelphia and New York, but it's, uh, it's way, way, way more accessible. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you can, you can buy a house still in Baltimore in some neighborhoods for under a hundred thousand dollars, which is unheard of in certain other cities across the country right now. And there are a lot of people who are willing to kind of help and support you invest in becoming a resident in Baltimore. So, you know, if you come across people who are interested in that type of opportunity, send them our way. And we'd always be happy to kind of get them to the right people who want to make that possible. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. When I started Black Knight Ownership, it was more the idea of rural areas and figuring out how to get folks in New York access to land that would be affordable. Because like where I live in New York, the buildings that I'm in, it would be a million, three, you know, $1.3 million. Yep. Um, and you'd still have to renovate it <laughs> once you purchased it. And more and more, I'm meeting people that are also involved in urban areas and not doing the flip a house plan. Because I know that there are people that already do that. There's, you know, a lot of awareness of that. But more this idea of like, no, keep homes in families for generations and start understanding the importance of that. Not looking at it like a burden, not saying, oh, well, the taxes are too high, but recognizing the value of property and the community that revolves around that. Uh, and so we, we're now working more and more with urban groups and, and groups that are, I think, doing these initiatives that are saying, hey, if your grandmother's had the house, let's figure out a way to keep it so the grandkids and great grandkids have access to it. Yep. That's um, amazing. I mean, look, it's the for most families, the home is the single greatest like wealth generator. And it's the, the mechanism and the vessel through which intergenerational wealth is passed on, either the property directly or eventually the sale. And, you know, when I think about Baltimore and when I have my friends from D.C. or Philadelphia or New York come, they can't believe that like you could buy a condo within walking distance of a train station for under 100000 that you could buy, you know, a three bedroom row house in a waterfront community for under 200,000. Um, these are accessible opportunities to home ownership and wealth creation and the ability to build equity. And we have policies in Baltimore right now that limit how much your property tax can go up if you buy and live in owner occupied properties. So there really is a way to kind of pick a neighborhood that makes sense for you, whether you're an artist and you need artist studio or whether you've got a young family or if you're an empty nester and do it in a way that you can build wealth and still be in a position to transfer it onto your heirs in the future. Wow. Well, I appreciate having you on. That was very informative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, we have Matt Gallagher, president and CEO of the Gold Sector Foundation. Uh, this has been Just For My People. Is there anything you'd like to say on your way out? No. Hey, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I wish you well on your work. 
And if there's anything we can do to be helpful to you in Baltimore, please don't hesitate to reach back out. For sure. Uh, again, enjoy your afternoon. And that's a wrap. Appreciate it.